These are my disclosures. I'd like to start by pointing out that it's exactly 10 years that we've been talking about Noshua mutations. They were reported for the first time September 2009 by an Italian group, by the way. And now we know that NOTCH1 is recurrently mutated and possibly clinically relevant for CLL patients, but we have also unraveled part of the biology underlying why this happens in, in patients. Let me start about what we know uh, about NOTCH1 mutations in CLL. We know that it's potentially the most recurrently uh, single gene mutation in these patients, and we know that mutations typically target two areas, two hotspots of the gene. From the protein point of view, the effect is the same one. The patients end up with a shorter version of NOTCH1, and I will tell you what this means in terms of biology. If we look at the prevalence of the mutations, this will be around 10% depending on the uh, cohorts of patients at diagnosis, and it increases to up to 20% in patients that are difficult that relapse in therapy, and reaches one in three uh, of patients that actually experience the Richter syndrome. Uh, when looking at time to uh, uh, progression and overall survival, if we consider patients that have fully clonal uh, notch one uh, mutated uh, CLL, we can see that they experience a much earlier uh, need for therapy, and we can also see that they experience a shorter overall survival, although this is not so true for patients that have subclonal notch one mutations. What about the biology? What do we know? First of all, we know the NOTCH1 is always expressed, whether it's mutated or wild type, all CLL cells bear NOTCH1 on the cell surface. Second thing we know is that there's variable levels of activation. What you see in the black band is essentially what people refer to as the NICD, so the active part of NOTCH1. And I will tell you a little bit more how the system works in a little bit. And as you can see, there's patients that have no band and patients that have bands. And this means variable levels of activation. In general, when patients have NOTCH1 mutations, they have a constitutively activated signal, but also patients that carry wild type notch one at times can have active, constitutive activation of the signal. However, if we take CLL cells and we plate them in culture, what invariably happens is that the signal is shut down. You can see, uh, is there a pointer? You can see here that the black band disappears after a 24-hour period of cells in culture. However, we can bring up notch one activation again if we use the right context of environment. These large, big cells are referred to as nurse-like cells, and perhaps you can see it, perhaps not, but if you co-culture CLL cells with these big cells, you can see a green dot, which is notch one inside the nucleus. There, the molecule is again active in promoting gene transcription. And the ligands are abundantly present in the human body. This is histology. There's different families of ligands. But the take-home message is that, sorry, I have to go back one. Yes, the take-home message is that there is abundance of the ligands, particularly in the lymph nodes. Here we had the chance to compare peripheral blood, bone marrow, and lymph nodes from the same patient taken on the same day. And what you can see is that selectively in the lymph nodes, there's higher activation, constitutive activation of NOTCH1 and of its reporter genes. Now, very briefly, how does the system work? So NOTCH1 is a transcription factor. However, it normally stays on the membrane. In order to get activated, it needs to be engaged by a ligand that I showed you is abundantly present. This triggers a number of proteolytic uh, cleavages that allow the NICD, so the active form, to go into the nucleus. There it binds to a complex of protein that activates transcription and it is rapidly shut down by phosphorylation and ubiquitination. This is sensitive. It's a time-sensitive signal that has to stay on for a limited time. So what is the difference between the wild-type patients and the notch mutated patients? Essentially, the amount of time that the signal stays on in the nucleus. Here we had a cell line that was engineered to be either notch one wild type or bearing the mutation. And as you can see, as in patient, it bears the mutation in a heterozygous state. It needs the ligand in order to get activated. You can see the black bands appearing. The difference between the wild type and the mutant is that if you remove the cells from the ligand, the wild type will very rapidly sh uh, shut down the signal. This doesn't happen in a mutant cell where you can see persistence of the signal. And you can also see persistence of the genes that are activated by notch one. 
So if you want to visualize it in the nucleus, what happens when you have a mutant and ICD is that there is a competition between this molecule, the mutant molecule, and HDAX for this molecule, which is called RBPJ. Let me put it in a simpler way. Without notch one, RBPJ is bound to the histone deacetylases. When you have a notch one protein coming in, it displaces the HDAC, which, that, which then goes and binds DNA methyltransferase. So what can we expect if the signal stays on for longer than is needed? We can expect two things. The first one is that the, the genes that are directly regulated by notch one will be translated for longer time. And the second thing that we can expect is that the genes that are assigned silence, but the DNA methyltransferase will be silent for a longer time. We can actually visualize this by co-immunoprecipitating the various players and measure their degree of interaction. So this phenomenon might explain, for example, an observation that was made by Walter Gatte. We collaborated with him a few years ago, where we compare CD20 expression in, not, in a CLL patients carrying trisomy 12. And you can see here that wild type patients express significantly higher level of CD20 on the cell surface compared to the mutant. And you can also see that cells that are wild type are targeted by rituximab much better than cells that are mutated. And this might explain results from the German CLLA trial where investigators showed that notch mutated patients potentially respond uh, slightly worse to rituximab than notch one wild type patients. But we want to move from a single gene to a genome-wide view. So what are the gene signatures that are modulated by notch one in CLL cells? Well, we read this very interesting paper by uh, Ricardo Favre group where they essentially compared uh, the expression patterns of cells that had an activated notch one in the nucleus compared to cells that had, that lacked uh, the ICN, so the activated domain in the nucleus. And what came out very interestingly was a PISA receptor signaling pathway. This is very interesting because it potentially provide a link between notch one and the main driver of CLL biology. And so to address, to ask this question of whether there is a crosstalk between Notch1 and, and the BCR, we put together a cohort of patients. Actually, most of them were, are, are RICS, uh, uh, RICS patients here at Cornell, where we, we compared the Notch1 wild type and Notch1 mutated patients, bearing in mind to have most uh, uh, patients as similar as possible in terms of uh, uh, lack of mutations in the IGV genes and in terms of uh, uh, fish abnormality, so that we were comparing cohorts uh, that were similar. And of course, we uh, selected for fully clonal Notch1 mutations. So here I just want to make two, uh, three points uh, for the uh, for, uh, sake of time. The first point is that if we look at the BISA receptor, constitutive BISA receptor pathway activity in patients that have Notch1 mutations, steady state, you will see the D cells respond better to calcium, and they show an enhanced phosphorylation of the key players of the BISA receptor, telling us that patients that have non-Oshua mutations have a constitutively higher level of BISA receptor activation. Two more things. If we open the circuit and we trigger uh, notch one activation, what we see is that we end up with transcription of genes that are under that are essential for the B cell receptor signaling pathway, including SICK, BTK, and BLINK. So if we activate NOTCH, we have more partners of the B cell receptor. Vice versa, if we activate the B cell receptor selectively in a NOTCH1 mutated subset, we end up with more NOTCH1, and we end up with a higher level of NOTCH1 activation, therefore forming a molecular uh, circuit, uh, where, uh, whereas the two players are linked together. Uh, is there a clinical uh, translation or implication for these observations? Well, there was a recent paper coming uh, that came out also from an Italian group, not one like the Italians, uh, that came out, I think, a couple of weeks ago, saying that uh, Notch1, the presence of the activated band of Notch1 could be a marker of response to ibrutinib. So here there were patients that were followed over time when they received ibrutinib, and uh, uh, they looked at the presence of the activated Notch1 in the nucleus, so simply in cells that were in the blood, and you can see that they decrease when patients respond, and they seem to pick up again when patients relapse. So this could be obviously a very important tool if it could work as a marker, but also the other idea is that it can become a target. 
So we could actually co-target the BSA receptor and NOTCH1. And several people have looked into this, including us, adding BC, BTK inhibitors together with NOTCH inhibitors. In vitro, it seems to work in that you have a higher uh, degree of apoptosis. But after this morning, with so many drugs and such a crowded space in the CLL field, I don't think this is, will ever get into something more that, uh, that in vitro, at least for CLL patients. One possibility, though, is to uh, look at this therapeutic strategy in a subset of CLL patients that undergo uh, transformation to, uh, to Richter's. Here, there's very few therapeutic options. A few years ago, when I was in New York working with Rick, we had a chance to establish a, a patient-derived xenografts from a couple of his Richter's patients. And so what happens is that we were able to propagate these cells serially in mice. After when they engraft, they stay genomically stable. So they don't acquire mutations, and they are closely related to the original patient clone. We have four models so far, and one of them carries the typical exon 34 notch one mutation. Interestingly, this model is the one that shows constitutively high notch one activation and has the highest level of DSA receptor activation. And so we said, why don't we treat these animals? We, uh, uh, we engrafted these cells into animals' IV, and then we waited for engraftment, and then we had five doses uh, uh, pause a weekend holiday and then another five doses and then we assessed disease spread. If you look at the spleen of these animals, what we could see is animals that were treated with a combination of ibrutinib and a NOTCH1 inhibitor had the, slowest, uh, the, the, the smallest spleen, and this was due to the lowest uh, tumor cell colonization as a highlighted by staining with human antibodies. And we could also see that histologically by looking at spleen involvement. Then we followed the mice for survival, and you can see that the combination of ibrutinib together with a NOTCH1 inhibitor uh, essentially yields a prolongation of a few days, which is quite significant for this leukemia, which is very aggressive, for this lymphoma, which is very aggressive and essentially does not respond to any other therapy that we have uh, uh, we've used so far. So what are the conclusions? Well, we know that NOTCH1 is recurrently mutated in CLL cells, and we know that NOTCH1 mutations identify patients that will likely be in earlier need for treatment and potentially will survive less. We know that this is due to biological events that occur because of a shorter version of the mutated protein, which affects gene transcription inside the nucleus as well as gene silencing. One of the major players that interacts with NOTCH1 is the B receptor, and so that there is a cross-talk between the BSA receptor and NOTCH1, which opens the way for thinking of strategies for ex ex um, exploiting this collaboration in a therapeutic way or to monitor therapy. And this is the most important slide. This work was mostly done by Francesca here, Francesca Ruga in my lab. These are the sources of funding. And of course, it all started uh, when I was here working with uh, Rick Furman and John Allen. Uh, for uh, the BCR work, we had some help from the uh, Frida Stevenson uh, and Francesco Forconi group in Southampton. Thank you all for your attention.